on how to go about that. We now come to the motion on the future of overseas territories. Um, before we... One moment. Overexcited. Yeah, fine. Just... Um, before we start, can I indicate now that in order to accommodate not only this but the subsequent debate, I am placing a five-minute limit on speeches after the front benches have spoken. Alicia Kearns to move. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I beg to move the motion in my name on the order paper, and I start by declaring an interest in the debate as Chair of the All-Party Parliamentary Group for Turks and Caicos. Uh, can I thank the Backbench Business Debate for granting this debate on the date of the Joint Ministerial Council, which is the annual summit of overseas territories here in London. Can I also thank great friend of the overseas territories, the Honourable Member for Bracknell, uh, who kindly I inherited this debate from, who had first put it forward, and all those who have come to the Chamber today to speak on that great thing that is British Overseas Territories. Finally, Mr Deputy Speaker, I invite the whole House to, welcome, uh, to join me in welcoming representatives, civil servants and elected representatives from seven overseas territories who join us today in the yeah, Chamber to observe yeah, the debate yeah, from the yeah. public gallery. It is a joy to have them with us. Over the last week, we have witnessed our global British family at its very best. The coronation of His Majesty the King was a special moment, and these leaders of overseas territories there representing their communities with great pride was a historic moment. Now, whilst Mr Abbey may only be a short distance from this place, it's a mighty long way if you're coming from Tristan de Kuna or Pitcairn Island, and the long voyages undertaken by leaders of every overseas territory demonstrate the bonds that unite our global family. As I mentioned, the JMC is taking place where the leaders of overseas territories come together. I would point out here to the Minister that last year the JMC was cancelled at extremely short notice when some leaders had well uh, begun their journeys to London, for some of whom it takes over two weeks, and so I'm keen to see that today is particular success. British overseas territories span Europe, the Caribbean, the Pacific and the Atlantic. They vary in size, population, culture, climate, food, traditions, challenges and opportunities. The British global family is diverse and requires policy that recognises this diversity, and that is what we will debate today. I hope the Government will adopt an ethos that recognises the unique circumstances of each territory and make sure they feel heard, valued and supported. Be Happily. I am very grateful to her for giving way. Will she agree with me that the bedrock of the 16 British Overseas Territories is the concept of the right of self-determination. And yet, in the case of the British Indian Ocean Territory, this government is ignoring the views of the Chagossian people and negotiating directly with the third-party country, Mauritius, against the interests of the indigenous people. Yeah. Uh, I thank the Honourable Gentleman for that intervention. I'm sure I see a number of colleagues who plan to go into that into their own speeches, so I will make progress on my own point so that all other colleagues do not see their speeches cut short. Uh, our debate today is not one of a paternalistic House of Commons, but a body of representatives that recognise that within families there are responsibilities, but also great opportunities. So today I will set out specific requests, but also commonalities that need to be raised within our family. It is, however, to the point just made, worth reiterating that all British overseas territories enjoy the right to self-determination, as set out within Article 1 of the UN Charter. They decide their own government and their own constitutional relationship with the United Kingdom. The fact they have decided to maintain a constitutional right with us does not diminish this most sacred of rights. And I'm sure the whole House will join me in reiterating our wholehearted and unwavering commitment to defending this principle in spirit and in law. However, whilst we believe there is no question or debate over the right to self-determination, some members of our family face people seeking to undermine this fundamental right. At the G20 talks in March this year, Argentina unilaterally ended the 2016 Falklands Islands Pact. This was wrong. The government must continue to reject any demands from Argentina to revisit the issue of sovereignty of the Falklands. We must be clear that the right to determine the future of the Falkland Islands is a sole prerogative of its islanders. Yeah, yeah. And in 2013, 99.8% of all Falklanders who voted chose to remain British. There can be no right over self-determination. I would also like to draw the House's attention to another area where the Falklanders require our support. Under UN Convention 24, the Falklands are currently classified as a non-self-governing territory. 
but we know that is factually incorrect. Both under the first Falklands Constitution signed in 1985 and under the new constitution signed into law by Her Majesty the Queen in 2009. The Falkland Islands are self-governing, but willing to refer their foreign and defence policy to the United Kingdom. The Government should help the Falklands to, mis uh, to correct this misclassification so that they can be recognised at the UN as the proud self-governing territory that they are. When we talk of sovereignty, I turn then to Gibraltar and their right to remain as a UK overseas territory. Under the double lock guarantee, the UK has given a solemn assurance that we will never enter into any negotiation on Gibraltar sovereignty in which Gibraltar is not content. The negotiations post-Brexit are not yet concluded, and we must ensure they are guided by this double lock principle, and I'm sure the House would condemn any future compromise on this. If, for whatever reason, Gibraltar is left with a no-negotiated outcome, I would urge the Government to provide the support needed to deal with any economic uncertainty and ensure the continued success of the ROC. Now, whilst overseas territories choose to remain part of our global family, that does not mean that we should blindly accept the status quo. We should challenge ourselves to provide the best possible support to their individual hopes and needs and strive to support them to achieve. We should embed engagement government, uh, across government directly with overseas territories, rather than relying on all manners of priorities to be dealt with through the Foreign Office as some sort of arbiter. There is widespread frustration about just how difficult it is to engage in either the most basic of dialogue with government departments. And surely, given our belief in self-determination, it is only right that overseas territories make their own case to government departments rather than relying on the Foreign Office to act as messengers. They make their own case best when their voices are heard. This will also help tackle any lingering belief in paternalistic governance. And the Foreign Affairs Committee itself made this recommendation in 2019 because neither their territories nor their citizens are foreign, and therefore it is fundamentally at odds to have them supported through the Foreign Office. So they can I therefore urge the government to drastically change how OTs are treated, and that either starts with beefing up the powers of the Overseas Directorate, so it's not seen as some sort of backwater, I apologise to the civil servants present in the chamber today, and make sure that it has the powers it is needed and the Minister gives it sufficient focus it required. I would also urge the Minister to have all government departments update their strategies on the OTs because not one of them is less than a decade old. That cannot be right. We need to update the individual strategies. Now, the UK's relationship with its OTs is characterised by obligations and opportunities on both sides. Problems, Mr Deputy Speaker, that we face, such as protecting our oceans. The British maritime estate is the fifth largest in the world. It offers sanctuary to a plethora of wildlife from the South Atlantic to the Indian and Pacific Oceans. 94% of our unique British wildlife can be found in the territories, whether it's breeding turtles in Ascension, coral reefs in Pitcairn, great whales in the Falklands, and the many species which the tropical forests of St Helena and Montserrat call home. Although I would encourage all wildlife lovers to make sure they follow the long-awaited hatching of osprey eggs in Rutland, which is expected in the coming days. Now, Britain plays a leading role in global conservation thanks to the partnership of our territories and two key initiatives, the Blue Belt and the Darwin Plus programmes. Without our global family, this would not be the case. It is safe to say, I think, Mr Deputy Speaker, that our overseas territory communities contribute more to protecting the ocean per head of population than anywhere else on earth and so we should be very grateful to them for making this contribution as part of the global British family. These environmental initiatives demonstrate the power of partnership but there are other areas where the UK can do more as a partner. One such area is education. All overseas territory citizens are British citizens yet it was only in 2022 that they were finally granted access to tuition loans when studying in the UK. The process for applying for a tuition loan remains far too complicated for those from OTs, not least because they have to send in their applications by post, which may be convenient if you live in Rutland or lovely Melton Mowbray or Port Pie fame, but slightly more difficult if you live in St Helena, which is nearly 5,000 miles from the UK. I will happily give way. Does she not think it's a great shame that the University of Gibraltar, newly established, is not entitled to accept British students on home fees or access UCAS system. It is one way and not reciprocal, and that needs to change if we are a true family. Uh, yeah. The Honourable Gentleman is absolutely correct, and we may not always agree, but on this we absolutely do. Oh, no. And I'm sure the Speaker, if he was in the chair, as I believe is he pro the Chancellor, Chancellor yeah. of the yeah. University yeah. of Gibraltar, would be entirely in support of your point. I'm sure he'll reward you later this afternoon. Um, <laughs> but we, education is absolutely key. 
The other issue is that OT citizens cannot access maintenance loans to support them should they come here. University life is already too expensive. We can better support those who come here to the UK. It's a matter of fairness. Please, happily. I am grateful to my honourable friend for giving way. Does this not demonstrate the absolute importance of government departments taking the overseas territories really seriously in terms of the policies that they, they um, develop and, the, in, and also um, the implementation of those, and why it is so important that the overseas territories have a strong voice in each of the different departments. Yep. Um, I agree entirely with my uh, right honourable friend, who was, of course, formerly Minister of the Overseas Territories, and I know that under her tenure, overseas territories felt incredibly respected and crucially heard. They don't want to be listened to, they want to be heard, so I thank her for all that she did in her time in that role. Now, whilst I may raise that financing university life is difficult, funding a government is more so. As a leading global economy, the UK can borrow money at beneficial rates, but this option is not available to our overseas territories. But during the pandemic, we allowed Gibraltar to borrow £500 million under a sovereign guarantee, protecting the ROC's economy at a time of economic instability. Where we can, we should use our economic clout to support our overseas territories, to develop sustainably, to grow their opportunity, their prosperity, and to invest in infrastructure. This will also help to avoid debt traps faced by many developing economies and the interference of loan sharks, such as the Chinese Communist Party. I therefore hope the expansion of sovereign rate loans to more overseas territories is something the government will consider. Now, whilst direct funding is important, I wish to make clear that most overseas territories are financially independent, economically self-sufficient, and are proud of that. But they do rely on us to present them globally and make their case. Now, there are, of course, caveats to this relationship, and I believe the UK was right to sign up to the EU Code of Conduct on business taxation in 2013. The Code of Conduct was designed to ensure companies could not avoid taxation. However, with our departure from the EU, this has left many OTs feeling governed by a code that they no longer can influence. So can I urge the Minister to look at engaging with them directly on this? A commitment was also given to implement the public registers of beneficial ownership by 2023. Can the Minister update us, please, on those? This is important because it provides greater public access to information about beneficial ownership, it improves private sector compliance with sanctions, and it can help preempt sanctions evasion and prove transparency about designated individuals. I know, for example, in the Cayman Islands, the Central Register has a 24-hour response time to information requests from law enforcement, and that $8.8 billion of Russian assets were frozen following the illegal renewed invasion of Ukraine. So we know how important this information is, not just to support sanctions against Russia, but all terrorists and autocratic actors. <coughs> My apologies. Finally, Mr Deputy Speaker, I would like to highlight accessibility as a common issue requiring urgent attention. Many overseas territories are extremely remote. I recently met with the Chief Islander of Tristan de Cunha, and I understand the Foreign Office is undertaking a review into the possibility of subsidising a boat to the Tristan government. Currently, a boat visits the island just 10 times a year from Cape Town. This would not be an expensive measure. It would massively help islanders, particularly during health emergencies. And my heart goes out to the individual who recently lost their life from a stroke, where they were unable to be removed from the island in time to receive the health care that would have saved their lives. This is unacceptable, as too are the quotas on how many OT residents can receive NHS treatment from each OT. A Tristan-owned vessel would also allow ecotourism to continue and develop more tourism revenue over time to pay for its upkeep. Tourism is key to our overseas territories in the Caribbean. However, if this industry is to continue to thrive, investment in airports and portage is needed. The Turks and Caicos Islands have an airport business development plan ready, but it is sat waiting for UK sign-off. Equally, Anguilla BVI they are seeking support with expanding and improving their airports. We must support, not hinder these projects across territories. But more than this, I would encourage the government to see OT-led infrastructure projects as an opportunity for British investment and for British businesses. It is not enough for us to always think only of action on the OTs when they are in trouble, when we should be enabling prosperity and growth. No one else is asking for a hand up, they're asking a hand out, they're asking for a hand up. So let us ensure accessibility, be it by sea or by air. In today's day and age, accessibility is particularly key also online, 
And can I urge the Minister to reconsider the decision to close down the digital support team for overseas territories? I was shocked to find out that this had been closed without making MPs aware, when it is absolutely vital that we help OTs digitise the services they provide to their citizens. I also wish to briefly touch, um, Mr Deputy Speaker, before I wrap up, on the situation in Haiti, because it is impacting severely on Turks and Caicos. Haiti is a humanitarian catastrophe and it is a state on the brink of failure. There is not one democratically elected representative, cholera is rife, and political and economic corruption supported by over 200 armed gangs who use Haiti as a drugs and firearms haven is suffocating everyday life for individuals there. The result is tens of thousands of Haitians fleeing across dangerous stretches of water, which often lead them to Turks and Caicos, which cannot cope. We each urgently need to work with the Caribbean community, the Organisation of American States and France to restore security and stability. We should also provide TCI with radar surveillance assistance, because that is exactly what the US has done, has done for the Bahamas, and coordinate a stronger naval presence in the region. Last year, we saw a leaked diplomatic telegram from the then Governor of TCI. He made clear that the UK had delayed in providing important security support to overseas territories, and particularly Turks and Caicos, when it was suffering the highest murder rate in the world due to drug lords transiting through the country. Then we were too slow. It took a threat to remove Turks and Caicos from our global family for the government to take action. When we did take action, the action was incredibly effective, and those responsible for the vast majority of murders are now behind bars and awaiting justice. So now our family is asking for help once more. Let us make sure we are not found wanting. I also do want to mention here briefly, Mr Deputy Speaker, a call for all overseas territories to fully support their LGBTQ plus communities. We need to legalise same-sex marriage and for the UK Government to do more than simply support it in principle. In families, there are arguments and disputes, not least across the Christmas table. But most of all, we know that we can talk to our friends and our family more honestly than we can to any other. So it's crucial we have this conversation. Mr Deputy Speaker, I started by saying that we are blessed to be part of a truly global family. And I would also like to pay tribute here to Mr Speaker and the other Deputy Mr Speaker, uh, Mr Evans, whose constituency I've temporarily forgotten, the Ribble Valley, the great Ribble Valley, um, for all they have done uh, to raise the voice of our overseas territories in this place. Together we do represent the best of global Britain. And our partnerships are ensuring the survival of the world's rarest creatures, protecting millions of miles of oceans. We are acting as a beacon of stability in a rapidly changing world. And our bonds of history and friendship remain steadfast, as seen at the coronation of His Majesty the King. Therefore, Mr Deputy Speaker, it is in the tradition of this friendship, and rapidly trying to make sure that I did not run over, uh, of this friendship and a spirit of optimism for the future of British overseas territories, that I commend this motion to the House. Yeah. Order. Um, the opposition and uh, government front benches and the SNP spokesman will wind up at the end of the debate. So we now move to five minutes. Lloyd Russell Moore. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy uh, Speaker. Um, I want to commend almost everything that uh, um, my honourable uh, colleague has, uh, has, has, has just said. Um, I want to focus on a number of areas. One was about the, um, uh, the UN Committee that looks at uh, the decolonisation of uh, territories. At the current situation, all um, uh, of our overseas territories are listed as non-self-governing territories. Um, in fact, we hold most of the non-self-governing territories on that list. There are four ways of being removed on that list and being normalised in international relations. And in my recent trip to Gibraltar, um, where the um, Public Administration and Constitutional Affairs Committee has just launched an inquiry on the current status of the overseas territories, and we are visiting and investigating uh, their status. It was one of the top priorities for uh, the Deputy Premier to be removed off that list. My conversations with the Falkland Islands uh, is similar. There is a determination that they wish to be removed off that list. There are only four ways to be removed off that list, either to gain sovereignty as a sovereign state themselves, or to gain free association, like a number of um, states have done with New Zealand, or to be fully integrated into Britain. Uh, and if we remind ourselves, that is the model that Malta voted for and asked for, and this place blocked it in the past. Um, uh, and I do believe that that option must now be very clearly stated that that is always an option for any territory 
if they wish. I think it was wrong that we did that in the past, and I do would love to hear the Minister say, if a territory wanted integration, i.e. to be able to send MPs to this place, a topic I'll come back into in a second, they will be welcome to do so. I think that is, we must make that clear. Or a bespoke option. The problem is, the committee at the UN is made up of China, Cuba, Iran, Russia, Syria, Venezuela. Whilst the first three options are yes or no questions, the fourth option requires a vote in that committee. And it's clear that under no chance, there is no hope in this world, that they are ever going to vote for a bespoke option of a British Overseas Territory. So we must find a clever solution that fulfils one of the other three that is a binary choice that doesn't require a vote in that committee but is a yes or no question to allow them to be normalised in international law. And why, of course, that is important for them is because it then gives them access to certain things at the United Nations and it allows them to stand proud at, on the international stage. But that does also require Britain to be clear that these territories are self-governing and they decide their future. And I was very pleased with the intervention about the um, British Indian Ocean territories. And we must be very clear that people who were displaced um, for no fault of their own should have the right to be able to have discussions about the sovereignty of that piece of land. And we, of course, should offer a decent remuneration package, whatever the outcome is. It was wrong of previous governments. My party, the party opposite, both have been on the wrong side of history on this, and we must make amends. Currently, the Crown Dependencies and the Overseas Territories are treated differently by different departments, one by the Department of Justice, one by the Foreign and Commonwealth Development Office. I think that is wrong. I don't think it is right today, and in my view, we should have a department that looks after the overseas territories, the Crown dependencies, with a Secretary of State. Now, that might sound like a big ask, but we have Secretaries of State for Northern Ireland, a Secretary of State for Wales, a Secretary of State for Scotland, despite the fact that those um, nations and regions of the United Kingdom effectively govern themselves and do their tasks, and those Secretary of States are to ensure that the wheels are oiled in their negotiations and deliberations with the British government. And the overseas territories and Crown dependencies, in my view, deserve nothing less, and that is what we should offer them. And finally, representation. It, to me, in this modern world, seems wrong that when we are negotiating international treaties that there is no representation. The fact that Britain intervened on Bermuda to stop their laws around the declassification of cannabis, which I think was right for them to do, was wrong for Britain to intervene based on international treaties that they've had no say on in this place. So I hope we can resolve that issue as well. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Amanda Milling. Thank you, Mr Deputy. Can I start by congratulating my honourable friend on securing this debate and covering so many topics? Thank you for that. And can I also declare my interest as chair of the APPG for St Helena? Now, as we've heard, dotted across the globe in some of the most remote and hard to reach locations, you will find our overseas territories, some of the most beautiful places in the world, but not just beautiful. Also, they lie in strategically important locations, giving the UK a global footprint. But most of all, they are, as we've heard, they are part of the British family. And this is something that government must always remember, respect and reflect in our support for them. I had the privilege of being the minister responsible for the overseas territories last year. And I want to turn back the clock to uh, the autumn of 2021. Countries across the world were still in lockdown, facing travel restrictions and grappling with how to deal with COVID. The territories were no different. But when I hosted the JMC in November 2021, there was a universal thank you to the British Government for the provision of vaccines to every OT in the world. And this was no mean feat. Like I say, these are some of the most remote locations in the world. At the best of times, getting supplies to them is difficult, let alone at a time when travel was even more difficult. But this team in the SCDO did an absolutely remarkable job facilitating this. I want to place on record my thanks to them. And I will never forget being on the, in the airport in the Cayman Islands 
where the British Airways flight landed in early 2022 with booster vaccines on board. This was a really good example of supporting the British family. Now, I'm sure many colleagues will join me in welcoming the news that um, there will be a, a look at the new OT strategy. And I would be interested to learn from the Minister this afternoon what the plans are in terms of the development and its publication. It would seem an ideal week to me for the voices of the overseas territories to be heard when developing this strategy, with the JMC being held today and tomorrow and a conference here in Parliament yesterday. One of the points that was made yesterday, which I think is important, is that this should be developed collaboratively between the government and the territories themselves. And one of the issues that I would like the FCDO to look at is how we work across government on matters relating to the overseas territories, which has already been touched on. I have to say, I did often feel like I was the minister finding myself kind of um, convening and conjoling across uh, government on issues relating to the overseas territories. So I was really pleased to hear that the Foreign Secretary recently confirmed that each department does have a minister dedicated to the overseas territories. But this can't be seen as a token gesture. They need to take their responsibilities for the OT seriously. One particular area I want to touch on, and I'm conscious of time, is how departments support the OTs in becoming more resilient. Resilience has been the watchword of the last few years, and it's no, tr no truer today than it was before. All departments should give, give more support to the overseas territories to prepare against unexpected shocks, whether these be a global health crisis, global inflation, and the risk of climate change. So very briefly, a, a couple of areas I wanted to touch upon is we've all seen global energy prices increase, and the overseas territories are particularly vulnerable to this. I know that there's a real enthusiasm and desire to transition to renewables. So it would be interesting to hear from the Minister today what further support can be provided to the OTs in achieving this. Climate change could be a debate in itself, as we had a whole panel session on this yesterday. But one point I wanted to touch on is in terms of the Caribbean islands and their vulnerability to hurricanes. And I would like an update from the Minister as to what preparations have been made with the Ministry of Defence to prepare for hurricane season. Hurricane Irma was devastating to so many Caribbean OTs, and we're still rebuilding critical infrastructure today, as I saw firsthand in Anguilla last year. And it's, it's infrastructure and connectivity, as we've already heard about, which is so important. There's no limit to the OT's aspirations and ambitions, but often if they are hampered by poor infrastructure. I will have to. I, I failed to mention earlier, on the point of Anguilla, 80% of their water is lost through their water infrastructure because it is so old. Surely that should be a priority for the government, making sure that their water infrastructure is rebuilt so they are not seeing this appallingly large amount of loss as they're trying to transport water around their islands. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And you, uh, my honourable friend is absolutely right. This is a really good example of how we need to provide support in terms of infrastructure. And she herself talked about ports and airports, the, the transport connectivity as well as digital connectivity. And many are seeking support, whether those who are kind of directly funded and supported by the UK or they're looking for a, 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 to attract investment. In some cases, it's capacity building and technical expertise. Unfortunately, I can't possibly cover every single project um, this afternoon. And also, I can't possibly cover every subject that we might want to discuss, but I do say my honourable friend did a sterling job in covering so many. But I wanted to wrap up by saying one thing, and it's where I started. The overseas territories are part of the British family. And we need to redouble our efforts in strengthening our relationship. Margaret Ferry. So, Deputy Speaker, it's important, given the responsibilities the UK holds in terms of the inhabited territories, that we take the time to recognise the close relationships we have with them. The ever-evolving geopolitical landscape will naturally influence our relationships with the overseas territories, and so the government's approach to those must evolve too. They cannot remain static. 
Much like Scotland in the 2016 EU referendum, Gibraltar overwhelmingly opposed leaving the EU, with nearly 96% of voters casting their vote for Remain. We all know the complications that have arisen for UK citizens resident in Gibraltar as a result of that. Gibraltar is also very patriotic. The people want to remain a part of the UK, and we saw that in 2002 when a referendum on joint British-Spanish sovereignty was held. Despite great affection for the Spanish, the people of Gibraltar are often described as more British than the British. That sentiment of wishing to remain one of the British overseas territories should be respected and protected. Mm -hmm. To do that, the UK Government needs to ensure that it is strengthening strengthening that relationship, providing a voice for Gibraltarians and fighting their corner. Examples of what the UK Government could do is support the case for Gibraltar's inclusion in UK healthcare procurement model, which would allow Gibraltar to buy medication at the same price as the NHS, and to once more draw a comparison between Gibraltar and Scotland. There is, there is a wish for the UK Government to replace uh, grant funding lost as a result of our withdrawal from the European Union. Post-Brexit negotiations continue and issues with the border are significant. Thousands cross the border daily and in order to allow the economy in Gibraltar to thrive, these crossings need to be as painless and easy as possible. And I hope that that is something ongoing talks are able to achieve. Another territory that has seen its sovereignty challenged, of course, are the Falkland Islands. While the Falklands were once at the very forefront of parliamentarians' minds, thinking particularly back to the 80s, they are perhaps a little overlooked in recent times. The Falkland Islands government held a referendum on their status as a British overseas territory over a decade later than Gibraltar, which I mentioned earlier. In 2013, with a 92 per cent turnout, over 99 per cent of voters were in favour of remaining one. It is important to remember that this result came at a time the Falklands were growing from reliance on the UK to becoming more of a partner to the UK, and as the geographical region the islands sit within become more important, the government should recognise the benefits of a British presence there. Argentina recently rode back in the 2016 communique and called on the UK government to renegotiate the island sovereignty against the wishes of the vast majority of islanders. Islanders know that they cannot take the right to self-determination for granted in the face of this. That is incredibly sad. Without that right, so much of the wonderful progress that they have made in developing their society would not have happened. Finally, just to touch on Bermuda, where well, the people voted to remain an overseas territory in 1995, and polling earlier this year has shown that 80 per cent of residents continue to oppose independence. Therefore, I am sure I am not alone in recognising that we should not take the allegiance of this, the oldest British overseas territory, lightly. In fact, we should continue to support and uplift this beautiful island nation. For example, Bermuda's economy continues to enjoy growth in the international business sector, with this industry providing 4,642 jobs in 2022. As one of Bermuda's key trading partners, it is imperative that we play our part in supporting the nation as they take steps to further strengthen their position as a hot spot for international business. In closing, Mr Deputy Speaker, it is important to reflect upon and celebrate these important relationships with the overseas territories, the progress that both they and we have made and encourage continued close working in the future. While many of these countries cherish their status as overseas territories, these are ties maintained through consent. The government must ensure that the British overseas territories are not merely an afterthought, an extra appendage to the UK, but recognised as partners. I look forward to hearing the Minister set out how the government intends to do just that. James Sunderland. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mr Deputy Speaker, I am very privileged to be called so early. Uh, thank you. I am also very grateful to my friend from Melton and Rutland for picking up the baton of this debate. Um, I wish to refer members, if I may please, to my registration of interest as well. As the Vice Chair of the Overseas Territories All Party Group and as the Chair of a number of individual um, Overseas Territory Groups, my personal interest in this goes back a long way. 
uh, I'm one of the few members perhaps to have served in Cyprus, in Gibraltar, the Falklands, the Ascension, South Georgia and Diego Garcia, uh, and I'm very lucky to have done so. The overseas territories are a vital part of our UK family. They are strategically essential in terms of footprint, basing and geography, but they're also essential to the projection of UK soft power around the world. They have a common language and culture. They have similar hopes and aspirations, and we must not underestimate or take for granted their value to the UK. So if I have to make one point today, one point only, it is this. Our overseas territories need more love. Mm. Yeah, yeah. In this era of global competition, the hunt for resources and strategic basing, and also instability across the world, our foes are circling, and we need to cement what we've got as a nation. So to admire the problem, if I may, for a moment, Brexit was not kind to the overseas territories. So what we now must do is lock the overseas territories into free trade deals with us and all of our partners, and also think more broadly to the Commonwealth. How fantastic would it be for Global Britain to have this network of trade arrangements, particularly with the Commonwealth, and just think of what that might be worth to the UK. Think of the potential. The UK white paper also from 2019 has gone nowhere. So where is it, please, Minister? But of course, any work that we now do, and I welcome the point being made about the new strategy, it has to be done with the overseas territories and not for them. The Joint Ministerial Council last year, the ill-fated Ministerial Council, has at least been put to bed now with an excellent session this week. Uh, and of course, the Minister is here, um, which is entirely appropriate. But ministerial visits um, need to be a lot longer. Does it need a minister in the House of Commons? Perhaps. We need to station civil servants there for longer too. And visiting delegations from the overseas territories to the UK, visiting the FCDO, need more than 30 minutes at a time. We have to be rolling out the red carpet for these very important people and listening to their concerns. We also need a clear and regular bilateral dialogue to fix specific issues because, of course, the OTs themselves are very different. One size does not fit all. Will he give way? Please do. I am very grateful, and he and I recently visited the Falkland Islands together uh, to celebrate the 40th anniversary of their liberation from Argentina. We were told at the time of our visit that we needed to do more to support the Falkland Islands in their negotiations with the European Union over tariffs on their squid and exports to the EU. Does he agree with me that we need to be more robust and supportive of the overseas territories when they are negotiating with the European Union? Thank you, and I agree entirely with my honourable friend. I need to be careful what I'm saying uh, for obvious reasons, but I entirely agree that that needs to be the case. The Falklands, for example, is suffering tariffs right now um, on fish, and we need to do that very, very quickly indeed. So why not also create a Pacific Department within the FCDO for the OTs and the Commonwealth? Longer JMCs, perhaps, and of course a new strategy. There's lots we need to do, as my honourable friend has said. So what about Pacifics? Well, I can't hope to cover the totality in five minutes, but, uh, but, but we do need a new trade arrangement with the overseas territories to reflect the changes with the European Union and other countries. The British Virgin Islands, in particular, wants its prescriptive court order lifted. It has a new government and a superb new Prime Minister, so it's time now for the BVI to fulfil its potential and to move forward. Tristan Takuna needs a boat, as we know and as we heard, for obvious strategic and medical reasons. And of course we cannot concede sovereignty of the Chagos Islands yeah. until we factor in fully the part of the Chagossians. Yeah, 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 and also yeah. the military importance of the Arpacalabo is very important as well. In terms of South Georgia, the fisheries could be brought under the governance of the Falkland Islands, and therefore residents in all OTs should benefit from the potential that we all have. And all OTs need the support that they must have in terms of infrastructure, utilities and climate change. So to conclude, if I may, the UK relationship with the Ibis territories has been referred to recently as benign neglect. Mm. That's a very powerful phrase. I don't subscribe to that, but it is a wake-up call for us in this place, and we need to do more, in my view, to cement our relationship with the overseas territories. The overseas territories should not be seen somehow as subordinate to the UK. They simply want to be partners, and self-determination must therefore be perceived as well as real. 
Lastly, one size does not fit all, as I said. This must be reflected in more of the red carpet given to each one and more bilateral arrangements. And Mr Speaker, the OTs are very special and they're very proud to carry the UK flag. The UK must therefore seek to get more from them, but also to offer more back as true partners for mutual benefit. Nothing is broken, far from it, but this is now a fantastic opportunity that the UK and its partners in the overseas territories must embrace. Daniel Kajinti. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. I had the great privilege and honour of visiting the British Indian Ocean Territory in 2019, when, at the invitation of the Foreign Office, we had the opportunity of inspecting the extraordinary naval facilities um, that we share with the Americans on those islands. The right of self-determination is a bedrock of all British overseas territories, and yet, in this case of the British Indian Ocean Territory, that concept of the right of self-determination is being trashed by this government and being completely ignored. And I've come here today to express my dissatisfaction with this government and its handling of the situation. The Chagossians were expelled. These beautiful people were expelled from their islands in 1968 in order to make way for an American military base. And they were treated appallingly by Mauritius. When they were expelled from the British Indian Ocean Territory, some of them came to the United Kingdom, some came to the Seychelles, others went to Mauritius and the Mauritians treated them as second-class citizens. The money that was given to Mauritius to look after them was not spent on them, but by, on other things by Mauritius. And when we gave Mauritius her independence in 1965, it was made abundantly clear that these islands, 2,000 kilometres away from Mauritius, which have never been part of Mauritius, were going to be apportioned off separately and would continue to remain under British control. Moreover, we gave Mauritius over £3 million in British taxpayers' money in 1965 as final settlement for these islands. Think for a moment, sir, just how much £3 million was in 1965. And yet now, 50 years on, Mauritius seem, uh, is determined to overturn this agreement and seize these islands from Britain. And we have lost rulings on this issue in the International Court of Justice when Mauritius has taken us for arbitration. And yet, the right of self-determination should be at the forefront of our conduct. Negotiations with Mauritius must stop. The Chagossians, which there are about 4,000 of them, must be allowed to return and there must be a referendum in the British Indian Ocean Territory of the Chagossians as to whether or not they want independence or whether or not they want to become remain British. And in all my conversations with the Chagossians, they are proud Brits and they want to remain as part of the British family. I will give way. The total territory is ten times the landmass of that of Gibraltar which we also use as a naval um, and military base. Does he not agree with me? You could create a fantastically thriving community in those islands alongside also supporting the military. And this binary option that the government has pushed forward is detrimental to all sides. I, I, I completely concur with the honourable gentleman's sentiments. Chagossians are descendants of slaves from Africa and Madagascar. They have their own language, their own food, their own music, and their own traditions. To hand that, and the 58 islands are paradise in the middle, in, middle of the Indian Ocean, to hand their territory away to a, to a foreign country is colonialism on steroids. And it would be an absolute disgrace uh, for that to happen. I'd also like to say how disappointed I am with other British overseas territories. And we have some of them here in the chamber today. They are very eloquent at demanding that their rights and the rights of self-determination. Gibraltar, in particular, always is very effective at lobbying us. But a key term of emotional intelligence, subject I've been studying recently, is interdependence. And yet, the overseas territories are letting themselves down by not putting enough pressure 
on the British government over the rights of the Chagossians. Because if the Chagossians' rights are ignored today, it will be their rights that will be ignored in the future. AUKUS is an essential naval agreement that we have signed with the Americans and the Australians. We are re-entering the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. It was Lee Kuan Yew, as you remember, Mr Deputy Speaker, who remonstrated with us in 1971 for leaving our bases in Singapore. We were going through a period of malaise at that time, lacking in confidence. And yet this agreement that we've signed with the Americans and the Australians, AUKUS, to re-enter the Indian and Pacific Oceans is absolutely essential, and particularly at the time when we see growing Chinese expansion in the South China Sea, stealing hundreds of atolls from the Philippines, Vietnam, Malaysia, Brunei, and other territories, pouring concrete onto them and turning them into giant military installations. So we, and I was asking questions about this to the Foreign Secretary seven years ago. The response came, we don't have an opinion about the uh, dispute of uninhabited atolls in the middle of the Indian Ocean. So we're turning a blind eye to Chinese expansionism in the South China Sea whilst bending over backwards ourselves to accommodate a spurious claim by Mauritius on our islands. We're also entering the CPTPP this year, the world's fastest trading bloc. And so this area is going to become increasingly important to the United Kingdom. I will end by saying that I feel so passionately about this issue because it goes to the very, very nub of how our relationship with, with the British Overseas Territories will develop and be protected for future. Please let us all collectively combine to challenge this government in its outrageous, nefarious, immoral conduct over the British Indian Ocean Territory. Henry Smith. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. It is a great pleasure to speak in this debate, and I pay tribute uh, to my honourable friend, the member for Melton and Rutland, uh, for uh, securing it. It has been a fantastic week of visibility for the variety of the British Overseas Territories, first of all uh, with their participation of the coronation of King Charles III uh, last Saturday, the always wonderful display of the British Overseas Territories flags and the Crown Dependency flags uh, in Parliament Square, uh, and of course the Joint Ministerial Council going ahead uh, uh, this week as well. Yesterday, it was good to see uh, the UK Overseas Territories Association conference take place in Port Collis, in Port Collis House, uh, just across the way, where we heard some very powerful uh, contributions about that sheer variety and contribution that the British Overseas Territories uh, from the Antarctic, uh, Europe, Caribbean, uh, the Atlantic Ocean, uh, Indian Ocean and Pacific Ocean uh, provide uh, for uh, this country and indeed their contribution to the world. Uh, and Mr Speaker uh, was very generous in hosting many represent representatives uh, uh, of the British Overseas Territories in Speaker's House uh, just uh, the other day uh, where there was the unveiling of uh, a window at the very entrance mm. of Speaker's House, a uh, uh, beautiful window uh, which displays uh, all of the emblems of the British Overseas Territories and Crown Dependencies as well. Mm -hmm. At that uh, UK Overseas uh, Territories Association uh, conference uh, yesterday, uh, we heard again uh, about the significant environmental contribution that the overseas territories provide, uh, not only uh, to protecting and enhancing biodiversity uh, from the British family of nations, but also our contribution uh, to the globe uh, with regard uh, to protecting and enhancing our environment. Some two and a half million square miles of ocean protected through the Blue Belt and Darwin initiatives. Really uh, a, a very positive uh, contribution uh, indeed. Uh, in the um, short time I have left, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I would like to briefly mention a few issues uh, already touched on uh, by some other honourable and rights honourable members. When it comes to the Turks and Caicos Islands, uh, the crisis that is occurring in Haiti is causing uh, intolerable 
immigration uh, pressure uh, on those islands and also uh, result in serious criminality. And I would ask uh, the government uh, to continue fully engaging with that. Uh, on Gibraltar, uh, I think it is very important that, again, uh, that their pragmatism and their patriotism is recognised and supported uh, by the UK government as they continue their negotiations uh, with the European Union. And following on from my uh, honourable friend, the member for Shrewsbury, um, of course, uh, I must mention the British, overseas, the British Indian Ocean uh, Territory. Uh, the Chagos Islanders have been, as I have said many times in this House, appallingly treated over the course of over half a century now, uh, from being exiled uh, from their homeland to being dumped uh, in other countries who have treated them uh, badly, to have their citizenship rights uh, denied. I'm glad that last year, um, an amendment I put down to the National Anti and Borders Act, that final uh, injustice on citizenship uh, has been righted. But there is yet, now yet another injustice that is being visited on them, and that is their complete uh, being disregarded by the UK government when it comes to being consulted and their right of determination over the future sovereignty of the Chagos Islands and uh, the British Indian Ocean Territory. Uh, that is appalling and it is, as my honourable friend has said, a security risk for us and the democratic world. Where we step back, China will step in. Finally, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I'd like to uh, add my comments uh, about the fact that the British Overseas Territories and our Crown Dependencies are not property, properly represented here in London. There should be a separate government department and a Secretary of State. They are neither foreign nor are they Commonwealth, and that needs to be recognised and respected. And also there needs to be representation here in this UK Parliament. I'll be delighted. I thank my friend for giving away the point. The one thing I did miss um, earlier was that in 2019, our committee, the Foreign Affairs Committee, said there should be an Overseas Territories Committee of the House of Commons, made up of members of the Select Committee, for example, the Right Honourable Gentleman and the Gentleman's up behind me, uh, Foreign Affairs, Defence, DEFRA, all those committees that best care about the issues that matter to the Overseas Territories. Does he agree that it's deeply concerning that four years on, the Government's given no consideration to the need for this cross-party, cross-Select Committee working? Well, I should perhaps declare an interest as member of the uh, Foreign Affairs Committee, and I should have also, Mr Deputy Speaker, declared an interest that I'm a member of many all-party parliamentary groups um, on the um, overseas territories as well. We need far greater recognition here, both in terms of how Parliament scrutinises policy towards the uh, overseas territories uh, and the Crown dependencies, and how they are represented here, whether there could be some sort of representation in the other place, or if they chose to be a part, uh, as the uh, Honourable Member for Brighton Kemp Town was saying, uh, of uh, this uh, country representation here in this chamber uh, as well. We need to do far better. Our overseas territories, Mr Deputy Speaker, are not backwaters. They are the very frontier of protecting our environment, yeah, yeah. of yeah, yeah, yeah. providing defence uh, for the world uh, and enterprise as well. It's about time that the UK Government properly paid them respect. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and can I declare my interest as Chair of the UK Commonwealth Parliamentary Association. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Congratulate yeah. my honourable friend for calling this debate and BBCOM for uh, granting it, and welcome those members and colleagues in the gallery who have joined us today for this important debate, and also to Mr Speaker and, and others uh, for their incredible support of the overseas territories, uh, making sure that they, they are not forgotten and I hope not seen as a backwater. My right honourable friend, the member for Cowlick Chase, was absolutely right in her comments. And I, you know, at 14 overseas territories are part of us. They're with us, whether it's the loss of our Queen, the coronation of our King. Uh, they aren't foreign, as, as the Honourable Member for Crawley uh, has just said, and they're not Commonwealth. Uh, they, they should be dealt with and, and supported and embraced as part, um, part of our uh, nation. Self-determination is crucial to overseas territories, but by virtue of the fact that the Crown, through the Foreign Office, has powers to legislate and direct quite large powers, Mr Deputy Speaker, we have a responsibility to our overseas territories here in our Parliament uh, to ensure that those powers of government are exercised carefully and fairly. 
um, and this debate is part of that today. But we've also had one example already talked about in the debate uh, with regards to when things can go wrong. And last year's Joint Ministerial Council is an example of that, where it was cancelled at late notice, you know, a, a, a very infrequent opportunity for individuals to come in from overseas territories and actually get decisions that may be long overdue. Um, overseas territories shouldn't lose out because of things that are going on in our government, they should be put above that. And I'd ask my right honourable friend, the Minister, and I do mean friend because he is a friend of mine, um, if representatives from the overseas territories are, you know, require more help, more ministerial resources, you know, whether he'll consider making sure that those are available to them. Now, we know that the challenges faced in overseas territories are as unique as each of them are. St Helena, the Ascension Island, Tristan de Cunha and Pitcairn, and, and I have to say again, when my honourable friend, the member for Cannock, was talking, I was grasping my badge here from uh, the Falkland Islands when I was there. It was May 2020. I think I missed being there for a lot longer than I thought I was going to be by just a few days as a result of the pandemic. Um, but a wonderful welcome that we had. Um, they're all very different and they're all very vulnerable in their own ways, um, particularly vulnerable to natural disasters. And I remember talking to some colleagues from Montserrat about the continuing impact of the volcanic destruction yeah. that was many decades ago now, but still continues to be felt locally. Yeah. So as our government continues to focus on protecting the environment and setting ambitious net zero targets. Perhaps the Minister could also talk to us a little bit about what more support we could be giving to our overseas territories in this effect as well. But as Chair of the UK CPA, Mr Deputy Speaker, you'd expect me to turn most of my comments to the role of our organisation in helping support governance in the overseas territories, because it's the UK branch of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association which does the most extraordinary amount of work. Uh, to support the UK Overseas Territories project, work done to support the UK government's uh, obligations to discharge its constitutional responsibilities to ensure good governance in overseas territories. Now, this project began in 2016 and works with each territory alongside the National Audit Office and the Government Internal Audit Agency to enhance good governance and oversight of public finances. Now, these things are absolutely vital to ensure the flourishing of the territories and the CPA runs many bilateral and multilateral meetings on top of this. At the end of last year, parliamentarians visited uh, Westminster for the fifth Overseas Territories Forum on the oversight of public finances and good governance, and the Speaker of St Helena visited last year, and the CPA facilitated a clerk's Clark, secondment uh, to Ang the Anguilla House Assembly in last July. Um, along with the Westminster Seminar in March and other meetings, the CPA does a huge amount to fill some of the gaps left by the government's approach to overseas territories. And we're very grateful to uh, the government for allowing us to have that opportunity. But at a time when our, our budgets are under pressure, I hope the minister might also take the opportunity at the dispatch box today to reconfirm the government's commitment to the CPA's role in this um, and also making sure that we have budgets available uh, to do so in the future. Um, I would, if time allowed, also have mentioned Girl Guiding UK, um, but maybe I'll have to leave that for another day. But uh, the withdrawal of Girl Guiding in the overseas territories is something I'll be exploring with them directly. Karen Bradley. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. And can I start by paying tribute to my honourable friend for securing this debate? I wish to make a short, brief intervention in my capacity as Chair of the House of Commons Procedure Committee, because it has struck me in the work that we've been carrying out that we fail very often in this place to recognise the impact of what we're doing here on those very important parts of our family, the overseas territories and, I would say, the Crown dependencies. Um, I was struck by this um, most when I visited Gibraltar last year, Mr Deputy Speaker, um, uh, as a delegate on the um, BIMR uh, regional uh, meeting of the women's uh, part of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association. There's a lot of acronyms there, but we, we did meet, and we were led very ably in our delegation by uh, your colleague, Mr Deputy Speaker, Madam Deputy Speaker, the, my honourable friend from Epping Forest. And um, we heard, when, as parliamentarians do when we get together, we talk about how often we meet and what the hours are and you know, what's the facilities like. And we were shocked to discover that in Gibraltar, the Parliament hadn't actually met for about five months. 
In fact, last year, Parliament in Gibraltar only met on six occasions. It's already met on eight occasions this year. And the reason we were given for the meetings of Parliament not happening is that there simply wasn't capacity in the system to have Parliament meeting while Gibraltar, on the front line of that land border with the European Union, was absorbing the impacts of leaving the UK leaving the EU on, the, on that te overseas territory. Now, I'm passing no judgment on, on, on the, the decision to leave the European Union. This is not a comment on that. This is a comment on the fact that in this place, I don't think we thought about that. I have a horrible suspicion that when we were having our debates, the issues of the impact on places like Gibraltar and other overseas territories simply wasn't debated. Now, I don't disagree that at ministerial level these issues will be, will be talked about and the Joint Ministerial Council, I know, will discuss these matters. But where in our procedures have we got the ability to give a voice to our friends, our family in the overseas territories and the Crown dependencies? Of course I will. She's raising a really important point. Uh, my view, as I've expressed, is that we should have MPs here with voting rights. But other areas do it differently as well. At least in the US, for example, they are there without voting rights, but full participation rights. We must find a solution along those lines, otherwise we are all negligent, because the best people to make their voice heard is themselves. I absolutely agree with the honourable gentleman that the best people to listen to on these matters are those that are actually from the overseas territories and I must say the Crown Dependencies as well because they are also impacted by what we do. Now, our interparliamentary parliamentary relations are incredibly important and the CPA and the BGIPU which I chair and also the British Irish Parliamentary Assembly which I'm honoured to co-chair um, are very, very important um, forums in which we can have dialogue and we can discuss these matters. But in the legislative process, we simply do not bring in uh, an ability for these matters to be heard as we pay, take legislation through. So as Chair of the Procedure Committee, and my honourable friend from Bracknell is a fellow member of that committee, we have been discussing as part of an inquiry we've been carrying out for some time on the territorial constitution, how we might work better as a UK Parliament, as Westminster Parliament, to appreciate the impact of what we're doing on the devolved nations, the Crown Dependencies and the overseas territories. And I intend, uh, as Chair of that committee, to make sure that we think about real changes to procedure that we could recommend and this House could adopt. And I sense from what's been said in this chamber that there is an appetite for that so that we can build into our processes uh, the, the, and our procedures the ability for those voices to be be heard because the overseas territories as we've heard for many reasons I won't repeat them matter so so much to those of us in this place they matter to our constituents and they matter to the whole of the United Kingdom and we must make sure that when we make decisions in this place we don't have unintended consequences that adversely affect our friends because that would be absolutely tragic David Jones Mr Deputy Speaker, and may I uh, also congratulate the Honourable Member for uh, Rutland and Melton on securing this important debate where we uh, celebrate the diversity of the global family uh, which uh, is formed by uh, the British Overseas Territories. And at a personal level, this debate is a particularly timely one for me because with the Honourable Member for Brighton, Kemptown and other members of the Public Administration and Constitutional Affairs Committee, I visited Gibraltar just two weeks ago, and I'm very pleased to see Dominic Searle, uh, the uh, special representative of the Chief Minister in the gallery, and I'd like to thank him for the excellent way in which he looked after us. Um, during the visit, we uh, met leaders uh, from across Gibraltarian civil society, from the Governor uh, and the Chief Minister to the Vice-Chancellor of the excellent new University of Gibraltar, whose Chancellor is, of course, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, and PACAC, as we've heard, has recently opened an inquiry into the status of the overseas territories in the 21st century, another reason why this debate is so timely. Uh, the motion today quite properly calls on the Government to ensure that the rights of the citizens of the territories as British citizens are upheld. Uh, and to be fair to the government and indeed to its predecessors, I believe that that is what they have been doing progressively uh, over recent years, particularly as a consequence of the British Overseas Territories Act of 2002, as a consequence of which 
the people of the overseas territories automatically became British citizens. And that, I found, was particularly welcome in Gibraltar, where previously Gibraltarians simply had the right to apply for British citizenship. And that British, Britishness is a source of great pride to the people of Gibraltar, and I've no doubt to the citizens uh, of the other overseas territories. Each territory, of course, as we've heard, is unique, as the motion acknowledges. The Cayman Islands and Bermuda, for example, have populations in excess of 60,000. Gibraltar has a population of some 34,000. Pitcairn, however, has a population of about only 40 to 50. And the government has a responsibility to take each territory's individual circumstances into account when deciding on its future arrangements and that, I believe, also is what it does. It also, as the Honourable Member for Brighton Kemptown has pointed out, has to take into account the stance of the United Nations, whose special committee on decolonisation uh, has judged that all ten permanently inhabited overseas territories have not yet attained a measure of self-government. Uh, I, I would question that. Uh, Gibraltar, for example, enjoys a huge degree of self-government. It has an elected parliament of 18 members with a chief minister and four other members with responsibility for domestic issues, including taxation. Indeed, it's almost entirely self-governing, save in respect of external affairs, uh, defence and internal security, which are reserved to the United Kingdom. Constitutionally, it is the case that the UK may legislate for the overseas territories, and this, I believe, is playing into a narrative that appears to have been adopted by the uh, Special Committee that the territories, in reality, continue to be colonies. I have no doubt, however, that in the case of Gibraltar at least, Gibraltarians are entirely happy with the current position. They certainly would not regard themselves as colonials. But this is an issue, Mr Deputy Speaker, that does have to be addressed constitutionally, as the Honourable Member for Brighton Kemptown has pointed out. Uh, I believe that an important function of the in inquiry that PACAC has launched will be to dis discuss and consider the options that are available to, the, uh, e to each individual uh, overseas territory. I think that there is a strong argument for saying that in the case of at least some of the territories, integration should be pursued uh, and that those territories should send a member to this parliament. That is what the French have done, for example, and there are very little arguments that the French overseas territories continue to be colonies. But, yes, I'll give way. I fully appreciate that many honourable right honourable members are making the point that we should have members of parliaments for overseas territories in this place, but I do think it's important that we reiterate that is only if that is the wishes of overseas yeah. territories, because I would make the point yeah. that when the Foreign Affairs Committee spoke to them, many said they would not want to see that. So crucially, I'm not dismissing those arguments, but I'm saying only if that is what they see as the best way for their voices to be heard in this place. Yeah. Well, yeah, the makes an important point, and of course the government's position is that the individual overseas territory should enjoy self-determination. Um, I, I actually spoke to a number of Gibraltarians who were very keen on the idea of integration, and I'm sure that that would be the case in a number of other overseas territories too. But that is something that PACAC will be looking at in the context of its uh, inquiry. So... Yes, I'll give way briefly. Was it not surprising that uh, everyone that we spoke to in Gibraltar and the number of people that have been contacted from other overseas territories said, I support it, but I'm sure someone else will be against it and I don't want to cause waves. And it might well be. There's overwhelming support, but it's never properly been tested by the populations of those areas. Yes, the honourable gentleman is entirely right. I don't think I met a single Gibraltarian who was averse to the idea of integration with the United Kingdom. And this is something that we need to, to, to consider very carefully. Uh, it, it's clearly the case that many Gibraltarians now, particularly younger ones, regard a trip to the United Kingdom essentially as a bus trip. They, they use the EasyJet and the British Airways service quite routinely. And they do regard themselves already as de facto integrated with the United Kingdom. So I believe that the issue of the constitutional status of the overseas territories in that regard must be considered. And to repeat, I believe that this is something uh, that will be, have to be carefully considered in the context of the PACAC inquiry. 
to conclude, Mr Deputy Speaker, the British overseas territories are important elements of the global uh, British family, which I think is quite clear from this de debate, are highly valued by honourable members on both sides of the House. The Government and the House should be careful to ensure that their interests are reflected and protected, and those are issues I believe that will be carefully considered by PACAC in the course of its inquiry. Mr Deputy Speaker, I am delighted to be called to speak in this debate and uh, reiterate the congratulations to my honourable friend, the Member for Rutland and Melton, for securing it. Much of what I will say in the next few minutes will reflect what I heard yesterday at the parliamentary conference in the OTs, because in the absence of any formal representation of the OTs in this House, of which we have heard much, I believe that today is an opportunity for them to have their voices heard through the medium of honourable and right honourable members. And on a personal level, um, I have long supported the OTs, as evidenced by my membership or vice chairmanship of several of the relevant ABPGs, as evidenced equally by the tie from the Falkland Islands that I was gifted when I was there in February. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, the, the word that has resonated loudest this week in the various events for the OTs has been family. The OTs are members of the British family, and as in any family, each member has its own characteristics, its own strengths and weaknesses, its own identity, its own uniqueness. It was put far more eloquently than I can yesterday by Gibraltar's Environment Minister, who said simply, there is superpower in our diversity. But like any family, each member will need support at different times of their life. And as one minister suggested yesterday, there has been a feeling that the OTs have sometimes been victims of a situation where others try to define their problems, others try to find solutions for them, whereas they need and want to do it for themselves with the support that is offered and available but not imposed. For many of the overseas territories, there are, of course, shared challenges, shared threats. There are others that are individual. We have heard a good deal about the shared threat from climate change, which in some cases is existential. But not all challenges are common, and I have been particularly struck this week by the experience of two territories in particular, Turks and Caicos and Pitcairn, for very different reasons. As the Premier of Turks and Caicos put it, his people live perilously close to the failed state that is Haiti. Other honourable members have touched on this already this afternoon, particularly the illegal immigration into Turks and Caicos that is rife and is exacerbated by drug running and gun running. Now, the authorities there are working extremely hard to protect their islands from the waves of uncontrolled numbers of people flooding their homeland, but I do hope that the Government here will offer help that can be taken up if that is so desired. The risks to Pitcairn are entirely different, but just as severe. With a current population of only 36 people, there are serious questions about the long-term viability of the islands. Sadly, the school has just closed because there are no young children left on Pitcairn. There are very few people of working age. The population is ageing. Pitcairn's mayor talked to me of the recognition of the need to adapt to survive. His hope, and that of other islanders, is that more people will see the opportunity of a life in Pitcairn. What I think struck me as particularly vivid yesterday was when he remarked that as one person from that population of Pitcairn who is in the United Kingdom... More than 2.5% of the population are here. That is how small the population is. But in talking about challenges, Mr Deputy Speaker, I recognise we must be careful not to imply in any way that the OTs are helpless dependents. The truth is very different, as they are all very, very clear, rightly, to point out. And to take just one example that was made to me yesterday, according to analysis by Capital Economics, the British Virgin Islands support jobs, prosperity and government revenues worldwide especially as a result of their role as a centre for financial and professional service firms. Now, having covered a considerable amount of the globe in the last couple of minutes, I'd like to say a little bit about the Falkland Islands. It was absolutely right that Margaret Thatcher as Prime Minister sent a task force to liberate the islands in 1982, just as it remains absolutely right today that we maintain a strong military presence to defend the right of islanders to self-determination. And during the trip with the Armed Forces Parliamentary Scheme in February, we saw how all three services of our armed forces each play crucial roles, both separately and working together. 
There are now new threats, though, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, to the Falkland Islands. Fisheries account for approximately 40 per cent of their GDP, but are under threat particularly by the illegal fishing by Chinese super trawlers just outside Falkland's territorial waters. So it is important the Falkland Islands economy diversify. And one potential solution is the extraction of oil. Now, of course, that must be done extremely carefully, given our commitment to net zero. But I would very much hope that the Treasury will give the proposals that are currently in front of them, known as Project Sea Lion, extremely serious consideration. I will indeed. Would my honourable friend also uh, share with me the concerns the Argentinian government's current rhetoric to Falklands, funnily enough, falls in an election year? And is it not utterly abhorrent that a politician would use the rights of individuals to determine their own futures for their own political gain? Uh, as in pretty much everything else she has said this afternoon, my right-hand friend is absolutely on the money. She is completely correct. And the way the Argentinians have behaved in this election year, as she rightly points out, is truly outrageous and incredibly offensive to the people of the Falkland Islands. And I know from talking to their representative uh, over the past couple of days, the Falkland Islanders are very grateful that we have recognised that in this place in recent weeks. Um, to conclude, Mr Deputy Speaker, the OTs offer, afford us a tremendous global footprint of strategic and economic significance. Gibraltar's minister rightly remarked that through and thanks to the OTs, for many years we have already had global Britain. And let us not forget there are plenty of hostile nations who are looking for new friends, especially in strategic locations. So we should not take our traditional allies for granted. Let us be clear, as the Premier of the BVI pointed out, that even in smallness there is opportunity. It was the Mayor of the smallest OT, Pitcairn, who summed it up perfectly, Mr Deputy Speaker. The overseas territories matter because they are British, because they are part of our family. Yeah. Yeah. Sir Robert Neil. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, this has been a most welcome and important debate, and I congratulate uh, my honourable friend, the Member for Upton and Melton, upon uh, securing it. Uh, it is right that we have talked about the value of all the overseas territories as part of the British family. I want to concentrate upon one part of that family in the shape of Gibraltar, and I declare my entry in the Register of Interests as having had the honour to chair the all-party parliamentary group on Gibraltar now for a number of years, and having had the pleasure and privilege of being a regular visitor to the Rock over that time. And I, too, have benefited from the advice and assistance that many members have had from the work of the Gibraltar Government representative office in London, headed up by Dominic Searle, who we see in the gallery. Uh, uh, Gibraltar is absolutely clear in its determination to remain solely British in its sovereignty. That has been reaffirmed by 99% of its electorate at two successive uh, referendums. It is important, therefore, that we do reject the notion that it should be classified as a non-governing territory, as with the others. With that, though, I just gently say to some of my uh, honourable friends is this. It is entirely for the uh, people of the overseas territories to determine their relationship in terms of representation here. Uh, any inquiry may, may be interesting and useful, but it will be presumptuous of any of us to try and suggest to any overseas territory what form their representation and relationship uh, should uh, take. In fact, actually, it will go slightly contrary to the suggestion of, of self-determination. It is for them to initiate. It is for us, as their friends and family, to support them in all the choices that they make. One of the choices that Gibraltar made was a to be British, b uh, to accept uh, a referendum which they had voted overwhelmingly against, because Gibraltar's relationship with the European Union, because of a land border, is inevitably different. And 96% of the voters of Gibraltar would have preferred that we had remained in the European Union. But the Gibraltarians, as part of the British family, went with the democratic vote of the British family. And we owe them in consequence of that. The most important thing that we owe them, and that must be delivered by the Foreign Office, uh, is uh, a proper UK-EU treaty on Gibraltar that re reflects the particular needs that Gibraltar has. Gibraltar has transformed itself magnificently over the last few decades from a traditional uh, garrison uh, come dockyard economy into a very diverse and thriving one uh, with tourism, uh, internet businesses and, in particular, a very successful financial services sector. To fuel and make that economy work, some 15,000 people a day cross the land border uh, with uh, Spain uh, at uh, La Linea. 
Keeping that land border free-flowing is an essential prerequisite of any deal that must be achieved in a way which respects Gibraltar's sovereignty and integrity. Yeah. That should not be impossible to do. It should be the top priority now of the Foreign Office in resolving the remaining EU-UK issues. It is the top priority, I assure you, of the Spanish Foreign Office. It ought to be a high priority for us too. It should work for both sides because, in fact, the economic prosperity that Gibraltar generates greatly assists uh, those regions of Spain adjoining it in the Hampa de Gibraltar. So it would be in everybody's interest to get this. We must get that done. Should, heaven forbid, uh, we fail, uh, then we would have a moral obligation to pick up the cost, the economic costs, that would fall upon Gibraltar in consequence. Uh, the best thing to do is make sure that never happens uh, and that we get a deal. The second thing is practical support that we can give uh, to Gibraltar uh, in various specific ways. The, the success of the University of Gibraltar, uh, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, has already been referred to. Uh, it's quite right that, that, that we should surely have them treated as home students for the purpose of access to UK loans. Mm -hmm. Surely, too, they should have access uh, to research funds, for example, the successor to the Horizon programmes. They yeah. lost that when we lost the EU. We should ensure that they are included. Gibraltar uh, University has a very successful uh, midwifery uh, course and programme. Bizarrely, Gibraltar midwifery qualifications are not recognised uh, by the UK Nursing Midwifery Council. That's something that I hope the Department of Health will put right. Do you want to me? The, I'm going to. <laughs> the most important thing beyond that is the position of Gibraltar's health service. Uh, the health service is not able to procure NHS supplies at the same price as the rest of UK procurement. That cannot be logical. Uh, those are the practical things that we do. If we talk about them my, being uh, family, right we should treat them as family. I happily give way to my little friend. Uh, I'm grateful uh, to my right and friend uh, for giving way. Also on the issue of Gibraltar Airport, uh, don't he, does, does he believe that it is incumbent on uh, the British Government to uh, seek to help the ROC as far as possible in terms of solutions uh, that actually could be extremely beneficial to them? Absolutely right. The airport was designed in a way which had relations uh, between Britain and the EU been different, could have been extremely beneficial to both sides of the border. That may yet still be possible. I believe there is goodwill. No one has worked harder than the Gibraltar ministers uh, and their officials to try and get a deal on this. Absolute maturity and good faith have been demonstrated by Gibraltar, and it's important that we support them in that. It's also important, too, that we talk, perhaps, to the MOD about the operation of the airport, because I was rather shocked to see, for example, the airport had to close the other day uh, because the Met Office couldn't send somebody uh, to make sure that the weather forecasts were available. We've got to get that right and treat Gibraltar uh, on a proper uh, basis. These are basics that we ought to get Will right. Will my right honourable friend give way? I thank my right honourable friend okay. for giving way. He touched there on the word official. Um, I just wanted to put on record and ask his advice as a, a learned friend. Recently, there was a controversy where a senior civil servant of the Foreign Office was lambasted and publicly named in the media as having undermined British sovereignty in Gibraltar. Does he share my unease that individuals in this House, or perhaps associated with them, chose to brief out against a Foreign Office civil servant who has no right of reply? They cannot contact the media, they cannot correct the record, and they cannot speak up on their own behalf. I am gravely concerned about the sort of reputation and uh, standard that is uh, set. Would my right honourable and learned friend agree that we should be considerate of the way in which we speak about civil servants who cannot respond? I am very grateful to my honourable friend. I entirely share that. I am glad to say that the Chief Minister of Gibraltar made a very clear statement after that unfortunate comment was made, making it clear that there was no question of concern by the Government of Gibraltar as to the competence or probity of the officials' conduct, and that fortunately nothing had been done to prejudice the negotiations. But the raising of it did not help at that time, and it was a needless distraction. And I hope, therefore, we will show the same maturity actually that Gibraltarians themselves have done throughout the whole of this process. The final thing that I was going to touch upon, uh, Sir Roger, uh, was the whole question uh, of uh, sovereign rate borrowing, uh, which has already been referred to. Because of the pandemic, uh, Gibraltar had to borrow uh, significantly. We were grateful for the support that they were given. Uh, they want to continue to be able to borrow money at UK sovereign rates, because the sovereign rate guarantee, of course, means you can get a, get a much more attractive rate. Now, given that we're already charging them more uh, than uh, the rest of the, the UK would 
pay for their NHS supplies, and much of this went to, to keep the health service going and their economy going, surely we owe them uh, the decency of a guarantee of 25 years repayment at sovereign rates uh, on the money that uh, was done to assist them during the pandemic. Yeah. Gibraltar is a brilliant place. I hope many members will join the APUG. I hope we'll be at National Day uh, again this year, joining with the, the people of Gibraltar, reaffirming their uh, British identity. But we need to give them practical support in the interim now. SNP Spectrum, Alan Smith. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. It's a genuine pleasure to wind up uh, for the SNP in this uh, genuinely very interesting debate. And I would uh, pay tribute to the Chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee for bringing this important subject forward. I think it's safe to say that the SNP's worldview in this stuff is different to many of the views that we've heard from colleagues today. Uh, Global Britain is not our project. The SNP, our vision of Scotland's future, best of Scotland's best future, is an independent state back into the European Union, acceding into NATO and indeed acceding into the Commonwealth in our own right. So we recognise that the UK is the successor state for a lot of the relationships we've been talking about today, and our primary interaction with the overseas territories would be via the Commonwealth frameworks and indeed our close friendly relationship with the UK post-independence. But where I say that Global Britain isn't our project, it is also worth stressing to colleagues, I don't wish it harm. The overseas territories are important partners. The UK is going to be an important partner for an independent Scotland. So even if our worldview comes to pass, and I accept many colleagues don't want to see that happen, we want to see the overseas territories do well, and we want to see a deep and flourishing partnership between the UK and indeed those overseas territories. And self-determination is part of the SNP's DNA. We would go further even than the United Nations does. We believe that the right of people to choose their government and choose their constitutional arrangements is absolutely fundamental to democracy. We recognise the right to self-determination under the UN Charter is limited. It's limited to cases of oppression, a post-colonial setting, and indeed invasion. But we would go further in that. So we would utterly agree with colleagues who have expressed support for the overseas territory's right to self-determination. And I'd also recognise that where that right to self-determination has a right to independence, it also has a right to decide to be a British overseas territory and have whatever representation they want to have within this framework. And I think there are a number of ways in which that could be uh, ameliorated and improved. But I deeply respect the choice of overseas territories to have whatever status they want and whatever representation they want as part of the British family. And I hope members would accept me on my good, good faith when I say that. But with that, that right comes responsibilities. And I think it is important that uh, we take stock of the relationship with the overseas territories. The coronation of the new king is, I think, a good opportunity to do that. That's a, t- a stock-taking exercise is taken across a number of the overseas territories themselves. We also need to take proper note of the relations that uh, our, uh, the choices that our uh, decisions make upon them. And I couldn't agree better that uh, the gentleman that said that Brexit has not been kind to the overseas territories. Now, we fundamentally agree on that point. The, leaving the EU in the way that we did has upset the constitutional balance within the devolved settlement for Scotland, Wales, England, uh, Northern Ireland, and uh, indeed London. All parts of the constitutional furniture within the UK were predicated upon all of us being within the customs union, the single market, and indeed the EU. That has been changed. And it's also been changed for the overseas territories. We've heard much mention of Gibraltar. I had a number of talks with the Gibraltarian government when I was a member of the European Parliament trying to find some solutions for them. But likewise, fisheries quotas for the Falkland Islands and lots of other things besides have not had the degree of attention that they deserve from this place. And I think there's a job for all of us to improve on that. I'd also very much uh, agree with the point the Chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee made that uh, if they're not foreign, dealing with them via the Foreign Office apparatus seems to be missing something of a trick. And I would suggest that Denmark and France particularly have ways of interacting with their overseas territories, which I think would bear quite a bit of analysis from the FCDO and indeed the UK government and more widely in terms of finding new ways of doing this, but always accepting that it's up to the overseas territory to decide the interaction that they want and they deserve. It's not for anyone to tell them what it should be. But policy uh, impacts and policy coherence is deeply important. And friends can speak honestly to friends. And I think it's also worth us recognizing that a number of the overseas territories are globally recognized industrial tax evasion centers. And I think there are implications for us, especially as we see with the consequences of the Russian invasion, stepping up of the invasion into Ukraine, that there's also a role in sanctions busting there as well. And I think policy coherence is really important that it is ensured. I've mentioned from this space a number of points 
uh, as we were sanctioning Russian oligarchs, as we were sanctioning Russian organisations and seizing dirty money, the overseas territories have a really important role to play in that as well. So I would pick up on comments of the need for uh, a register of beneficial interests to the Minister. I think that is a deeply important thing for transparency at home, but it also is for abroad as well in the overseas. Happily. Very serious allegation that some British overseas territories are tax havens or being used in some nefarious way uh, for, for funds. Which ones is he referring to and what evidence does he have for that? be more polite and say that some are and uh, indeed some aren't, but if he wants some statistics, in February 2022, Transparency International linked 830 million worth of property in the overseas territories and Crown dependencies to individuals close to Russian President Vladimir Putin. In 2018, Global Witness said that £34 billion pounds was currently invested by Russians with links to the Russian government in overseas territories. The Global Witness report uh, of uh, 2018 also said that uh, the total of £68.5 billion in foreign direct investment from Russian residents had been directed towards the overseas territories from 2007 to 2016. Now, I acknowledge progress has been made by some of the overseas territories, but we also must speak frankly to our friends. And there is an issue that needs to be dealt with. Happily. I this briefly in my speech, but I would just make very clear to the whole House every overseas territory has fully complied with the sanctions that this House have placed as a result of the renewed illegal invasion of Ukraine. Every single one. And so, whilst I agree with them, there are progress to make in other areas. On this, we should give them full credit. They have yeah. stood behind yeah. us on that. Yeah. 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 I'd agree with that point, and we've had a number of debates uh, across this, this place before where I've pressed for complementarity of the sanctions regime across the overseas territories, and a number have done very well. But we must maintain vigilance on this, and in the same way that London is a centre of dirty money, the overseas territories play a part in that network as well, and we must be vigilant on that point. But in terms of uh, other obligations, uh, reciprocity must go in both directions, and I would very, very warmly recognise the role that the overseas territories play in uh, the fight uh, to mitigate climate change and indeed to protect biodiversity. There is more that can be done to support them in those efforts. So it's right that we should be reassessing our relationship with the overseas territories. They are an important partner in what we all want to see happen, the protection of uh, people from climate change, the protection of biodiversity. And I think the UK can do more to recognise and support their efforts. The SNP wishes the Minister well in that endeavour. Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I would also like to thank the Chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee for securing this critical debate and ensuring that the concerns and the priorities of the overseas territories remain within the focus of this House and, indeed, uh, for the Government to hear. And I would also, um, as a uh, Shadow Minister in that capacity, draw attention to my declaration of interests, in particular my visits to Gibraltar and the Falkland Islands as guests of their Government uh, in the last year. And I'd also like to thank the members of uh, all of the overseas territories and their representatives who have been here today uh, for the debate in the gallery and have been here at many events this week. It was a pleasure to speak at the UCOTA conference uh, yesterday and to meet indeed with many of the Premier's Chief Ministers and representatives over the last uh, few days, um, and particularly to thank the, the Presidency of UCOTA uh, for the work that they've done this year. Um, it's been particularly special around the coronation of His Majesty and Her Majesty, um, and indeed absolute pleasure to see representatives of the overseas territories marching in that parade as well as the flags and, and all of the other things that we've seen and also to thank through you Mr Deputy Speaker the Speaker for the uh, leadership and work that he has shown on this issue um, and for his generosity in hosting us all this week in Speaker's House and I want to make clear that the UK's overseas territories are indeed an integral um, and cherished part of the global British family um, and it's been a profound honour in my uh, role as Shadow Minister uh, to have met with I believe now all of the democratically elected leaders of of the overseas territories. I've also been able to visit four of the overseas territories in my life myself. Um, I've seen firsthand the warmth and the innovation and diversity, uh, distinctiveness of the people and environments in each. I've swum with uh, penguins in the South Atlantic in the Falklands um, and indeed uh, taken tea at the Rock Hotel in Gibraltar. Uh, so I, I won't, I know what he's going to say, but he's, he's very kind. But we haven't got a lot of time. Um, but uh, but on, that, on that more humorous note, I also want to be very, very serious, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, I want to be really candid and honest. I think far too frequently debate and discourse um, on this issue has been based on some glib generalisations and a lack of understanding, uh, which fails to account for the uniqueness, uh, be that constitutional, environmental or economic, of each overseas territory. Um, I will give way briefly. He refers to the overseas territories quite rightly as being cherished. 
I rather doubt I'm going to get a commitment from the government minister for a referendum for Chagossians and the British Indian Ocean Territory. So will he and the Labour Party, uh, along the spirit of the lines of the Honourable Member for, from Brighton, will he give at le least a commitment that a, la that a future Labour government would give these people the right of a referendum for self-determination? on uh, the Chagos Islands and indeed um, I set them out very clearly in Westminster Hall in a debate that I believe he initiated a few months ago and I will come on to that in my speech uh, later on. Um, but what I want to say is that as well, despite some extremely committed individual officials and ministers in the FCDO um, and indeed individuals who work alongside the administrations, uh, we've seen far too little consistency, understanding, engagement and crucially listening. And I believe that on this side, in a future Labour government, we would set out five key principles which would guide our relationships with the overseas territories. Firstly, um, that we believe in devolution and democratic autonomy and establishing clear consistency on constitutional principles of partnership and engagement. Secondly, that we believe in listening. I firmly believe in the principle of nothing about you without you. Thirdly, that we believe in partnership. Um, a future strong and sustainable relationship between the UK and each of the overseas territories must be built on mutual respect and inclusion, and indeed across all government departments, not just the FCDO. Uh, we also believe that rights come with responsibilities. Um, our British family, uh, we share common values and obligations and principles, whether that's a robust commitment to democracy, the rule of law and liberty, whether it's to the protection of human rights, including, as has been rightly mentioned, those of LGBT plus people, women and girls, uh, people living with disabilities. Um, we believe in the advancement of good governance and, of course, ensuring proper democratic and accountability and regulation. And finally, let me be clear, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, for as long as the people of the overseas territories wish to remain part of this British family, we will robustly defend their security, autonomy and their rights. And as has been rightly pointed out, not least in the case of the Falkland Islands and Gibraltar, a very firm commitment uh, to their self-determination has been expressed by their peoples. Uh, that is the commitment of this side of the House, and I know it's shared by many across this House. Uh, we would move away as well. Um, Mr Deputy Speaker, from the notion that one size fits all. It does not when it comes to the overseas uh, territories. We need to ensure that our constitutional relations are diverse uh, and nuanced in, in law and indeed in practice. And in some cases, um, as has been referenced, the, the issues around sanctions, I actually agree with the point that was made. We've actually seen the overseas territories and indeed the Crown Dependency actually move faster in some cases than the UK government in implementing a robust uh, sanctions regime. And we've seen that in many uh, circumstances. But we've also heard today uh, that in many uh, decisions, um, our, uh, whether that's in our relationship with Europe, um, trade negotiations, climate negotiations, the overseas territories have not been heard, have not been respected and have not been engaged in processes at the heart of government. And indeed, we also want to see transparency in the way that the territories are administered. Um, there's been a call, I believe, from many overseas territories for, for example, a code of conduct for governors and for robust uh, processes and consistency in the way uh, that governors um, operate. I'll, I'll happily briefly give way. Mr Deputy Speaker, I had the uh, rather unique experience of sharing an apartment with the member for Cardiff South and Penneth and also the member for Shrewsbury. It was a very interesting dynamic for the week that we were there and it's quite true. I saw him swimming with penguins. But the point is a serious one. Um, having got to know my honourable colleague from Cardiff South and Penneth, I know that he's a clever guy and he gets it. So could I please ask him to assure the House this afternoon that Labour policy is to respect the military capabilities and the military basing and the military strategic imperative that we have in some of our overseas territories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, I can assure him of that, and um, indeed I will come on to that as well as a specific point. I just want to briefly reference the issues that have come out in this debate in relation to people. We've heard many examples, and I discussed many of them with the overseas territories yesterday. The impact that is for citizens when things are not done right, whether that's in relation to travel, healthcare, or education. We've heard of in Tristan, uh, Tristan Indians are unable to open accounts with UK retail banks. Um, students who hold uh, British overseas territories passports um, require student visas in some cases, but because of uh, the time in processing they don't get priority um, there's often meaning they're having to defer positions at um, higher education uh, institutions uh, we heard the issues that Bermuda face with their passport code um, issues impacting on their travel and opportunities um, and I share concerns that were raised about girl guiding suddenly being withdrawn uh, from um, overseas territories and indeed of course there's been direct impacts as we've heard of the uh, poorly executed Brexit deal not least in Falklands indeed in Anguilla uh, the Falklands fisheries now having to pay uh, 17 million euro in tariffs 
attacks on those crucial uh, squid. And it was an issue I did actually raise in debates uh, during that period. And perplexingly, a British Overseas Territory citizen is not eligible to use the passport e-gates at UK airports, despite having biometric passports often produced um, in the same way that our passports are, whereas people from the European Economic Area can use those gates. That seems to be an absurd uh, situation. I can hear the Minister uh, listening on the front bench. I hope that he takes that into consideration. And we've heard the real issues of, of infrastructure, of access to some, particularly of some of the remote territories. Again, uh, Tristan, um, Anguilla looking to um, expand and widen its runway, um, the issues that they face around uh, water uh, infrastructure, um, and indeed um, the issues, as I said, of many of the particularly remote territories in that. So we've got to see departments working together. It can't just be the Foreign Office, it's got to be the MOD, Transport, DEFRA, and so many others. We've heard a lot today, rightly, about environment. Um, our overseas territories uh, play a crucial role, um, whether that is the marine protected area in the Pitcairn Islands, um, the national climate change policy of Turks and Caicos Islands, um, St Helena's blue-green agenda, uh, Montserrat wanting to invest in renewable energy, but also dealing with the legacy of the volcanic eruption, and the Cayman Islands' efforts in conservation. Um, they play a crucial role, uh, not only in contributing to our climate change agenda and biodiversity, but also um, uh, in dealing first-hand with the impacts of climate change. Lastly, um, in, the, in the last minute I have to me, Mr Deputy Speaker, I want to re refer to security. Uh, we not only have a duty to protect and defend um, our citizens um, and our overseas territories, which we on this side are resolutely committed to, we also have a crucial uh, strategic uh, importance of many of our, our military bases and of our territories, and in face of geopolitical threats, whether that be from China, from Russia, from elsewhere, um, we have got to work closely with our overseas territories and in terms of defence, and not only to defend their citizens, but also to recognise the strategic import of uh, particular uh, Diego Garcia, Ascension, Falklands, Gibraltar, many places where the uh, honourable and gallant gentleman uh, served, and, and we on this side are absolutely and resolutely uh, committed uh, to that. And we also need to support them in their internal security. Um, uh, for example, St Helena um, has not had support from the Home Office in providing uh, checking watch lists and sanctions lists, and I hope that that's something um, that the Home Office can assist with. Um, on the Chagos, there is a complex set of issues, Mr Deputy Speaker. It's a historic injustice, uh, which um, I have rightly referred to in the past. It's a complex and nuanced set of, in, of, of issues. Uh, we must balance national security, our compliance with international law and obligations, um, the rights and wishes of the Chagos people who have long suffered, and I've listened and heard their voices very clearly, and also environmental and biodiversity uh, concerns, and I set that out clearly a few months ago. But let me be clear in conclusion, the overseas territories are a crucial and indispensable part of our global British family. We must have modern, uh, respectful and engaged partnerships with all of them. And on this side of the House, we will stand with them as part of that global British family. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, I congratulate my honourable friend, the member for Rutland Melton and the chair of the uh, Foreign Affairs Select Committee for securing this debate uh, on the UK's overseas territories. And I welcome the opportunity to recognise the UK's long-standing and deep partnership with our overseas territories. And uh, I'd like to pay tribute to my honourable friend's commitment uh, to all our British family. And I'd also like to uh, do the same for the honourable member for Bracknell, uh, my honourable friend, and for his service as well, which needs to be recognised. I too would like to put on record my appreciation, government's appreciation, for the Speaker's commitment to overseas territories and for the fast, fantastic event he hosted on Tuesday night, for all the work that he's done um, to support overseas territories, leaders and representatives, and progressing discussions uh, with key stakeholders over recent days. Um, <clears throat> I would like to join him in championing our British family. Uh, the Right Honourable uh, Member, sorry, Lord Goldsmith of uh, Richmond Park, the Minister for Overseas Territories, would have been delighted, obviously, to take part in this debate. Since he sits in the other house, it's my honour to respond on behalf of the government. I welcome the opportunity to recognise the UK's special relationship with our overseas ter territories and also recognise many of uh, the representatives that are here with us today and the leaders who are actively involved uh, in the overseas territories Joint Ministerial Council, which is literally in full swing, being hosted by Lord Goldsmith with the Foreign Secretary having also attended. Together, UK ministers and elected leaders of the overseas territories are discussing actions to support our shared goals, find solutions and uh, also work out how we can tackle uh, shared challenges. The Joint Ministerial Council is also an important opportunity 
to strengthen the UK's unique partnership with the territories, to celebrate our rich cultural and historical ties. And above all, it's a platform for this government to reaffirm and demonstrate its first and overriding priority towards the overseas territories to protect and promote the interests of British people. The government is committed to upholding our constitutional responsibilities and interests in the overseas territories. It was made clear in the 2023 Integrated Refru Re Re Review refresh. We remain committed to protecting the United Kingdom's core national interest, ensuring the security and prosperity of the British people across the UK, Crown dependencies and the overseas territories. The Prime Minister has recently asked each relevant Cabinet Minister to nominate a lead minister responsible for the overseas territories within their department. Lord Goldsmith, as a minister for the overseas territories, will convene a regular meeting of these ministers as a ministerial group to ensure that the UK meets its constitutional responsibilities. And indeed, several ministers from the UK government are meeting with JMC um, attendees today. The Prime Minister has also agreed that the FCDO should lead on a new cross-government strategy for the overseas territories, working closely with and in partnership with our overseas territories, a point that's been made by the Honourable Member for Rutherglen and uh, uh, Hamilton West, among many others. I'm not able to say at this point what the strategy will look like, but I am clear that the commitments in the 2012 White Paper remain relevant and that it will be developed in partnership and again, I stress the word with the overseas territories and the timing of when that will be developed is being discussed in the JMC right now. And I hope that helps answer some of the questions from my right honourable friend, the member for Cannock Chase, uh, especially given her distinguished service working with the overseas territories, the minister there. We believe that this is a way forward rather than setting up a new department. Uh, others have suggested that there should be MPs or some form of um, representation in this House. We so far have not had any formal representations from uh, any territory on this matter. Um, we recognise also the important role that the CPA is doing, the work that it has done uh, to, I suppose, share the word that uh, my honourable friend, the member for Bracknell said, our love, and also to support our OT family as set out by the honourable member uh, for, for Aylesbury um, and we've given obviously important support to the work of the CPA. I also recognise the important work of my right and rule friend, uh, the member for Stamford Moreland, my neighbour, uh, in recognising that there are impacts on OTs in the work in Parliament and we look forward to seeing her work on uh, procedure. And uh, we also recognise uh, the work that's been launched by PACAC, uh, a new inquiry on OTs, we're pleased to see that and we often look forward to hearing the views not just of politicians but academia and other states on, on what their views would be. But, as uh, my right honourable friend, the member for Bromley and Chislehurst has said, and we've echoed across the chamber, only the people of each overseas territory can decide their own future and what the relationship they want with the UK. Um, the UK is working in close partnership with each territory. Um, the overseas territories have first call on, U on the UK aid budget, and uh, there is a, an uplift in support for ODA eligible territories. The UK has provided 85 million of official development assistance to support St Helena, Montserrat, Tristan de Cunha, and the Pitcairn Islands, and this is an increase of 1.2 million from the previous year. Would my right their Montserrat, there is currently no working ambulance on the whole of Montserrat, as their only ambulance, and it, it, it's beggar's belief that there is only one for the whole island, is currently broken down. Uh, could my right honourable friend say what they are considering, whether within the A bit budget or otherwise, to get an ambulance out there, or perhaps colleagues could reach out to any of the local forces they have, should they have one they can donate? But this is an urgent issue. I understand the, point. Understand the point she makes. There's lots of detailed questions that have been raised today. I will pick up and make sure that the relevant departments follow up on these points that have been made, without question. Um, I will on this point, and then I will need to make progress, because the Deputy Speaker is giving me an eye. We know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 
thank you. I thank the Minister for giving way on the point of Montserrat. I was recently in conversation with my opposite number, the Chair of the Public Accounts Committee in Montserrat. They've got concerns about some expenditure from the Governor General's office, and we, they've been told, and I've been told by the British Government, that that's not, it's not possible for them to have sight of that. Well, I recognise in a small jurisdiction there are challenges. I would be really grateful if I could talk further to the Minister or the relevant Minister about this matter, because I am quite concerned. We're glad they arranged the meeting, um, as the uh, Honourable Member has uh, suggested. We're, we're also supporting uh, the overseas territories with, with funding dedicated to constitutional and international obligations on the environment and on climate. Exciting work that's being taken place there. I do want to reference particularly, Madam Deputy Speaker, the work we're doing in preparation of the uh, hurricane season. Uh, from the 1st of June, HMS Dauntless, which has a helicopter on board, very importantly, will provide persistent maritime presence in the Caribbean to offer humanitarian assistance and disaster response uh, ready for this year's hurricane support. Many uh, honourable members have talked about the importance of providing support in security. We, we, we have done that. Um, we will do more of that, uh, particularly uh, the face, in the challenges being faced by Turks and Caicos Islands. And as the Minister for uh, the Americas and the Caribbean, I'm well sighted of the situation in Haiti and will continue to work with interlocutors uh, and international uh, like-minded states to see how we can support in that situation. Uh, we're providing electronic border systems for the, island, uh, for the islands in Turks and Caicos and also maritime surveillance uh, aircraft, which will be a real help for them as well. Many, many points have been raised. Uh, I am afraid I'm not going to be able to answer all of them, but all I can say is that as far as um, the fisheries in the Falklands uh, are concerned, we continue to work with the Falklands to mitigate the impact of tariffs and are open to all opportunities to do so. Um, we uh, also have made, are making progress and will continue to ask for progress to be made on beneficial ownership registers. I would like to highlight that sanctions apply and they are being applied by overseas territories. Frozen Russian assets in these territories uh, amount to over, one, uh, over 9 billion US dollars. They are biting and they're playing an important role. Last one, and then I'd, I'd better make proof. Um, will he join me in commending the overseas territories in terms of the implementation of sanctions? This time last year, the number of sanctions were coming through in terms of volume and speed was enormous. And actually, being able to implement was a, a huge task, and I really do think we should commend them for that. Here, here. Here, here. Absolutely. This is important work. We also recognise, however, that there is further progress that needs to be made in terms of uh, the beneficial register, ownership registers, and uh, we are doing all that we can to support in that area um, over the weeks and months ahead. Points have been made about Gibraltar. Of course, we uh, are working hard to, um, with the government of Gibraltar to, in, to uh, make progress, and we remain confident that with flexibility on all sides, a deal is possible. Understand the points about Gibraltar University, and we'll work with the Department for Education on that. Important points have been raised about um, British Indian, overseas uh, in Indian Ocean territories and sovereignty-related issues there. While the negotiations are clearly between the UK and Mauritius, we recognise the diversity of views amongst Jagossians. We take those views seriously and have a further engagement event planned in the coming weeks. Madam Deputy Speaker, I think I've probably uh, taken as much time as you'll allow. I'd like to take more. But I'd just like to conclude by saying that we reiterate that the UK shares an important relationship with overseas territories. We're all part of the British family, and this relationship is built on respect and trust. We will continue to work in close partnership to strengthen our relationship yet further in the years and the decades ahead. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lissy to wind up. Yeah. Thank you, Madam yeah, yeah. Speaker. Um, I would really just like to take this time to thank all my honourable and right honourable men for, uh, friends across the House for taking the time to come and contribute to this debate today. It is too frequent that we get to hear the views, the wishes of our friends and our family from the overseas territories. And I hope today um, that all of you in the gallery have felt heard and felt listened to, and hopefully that we have given voice to some of the issues. I know I definitely tried to do an encyclopedia of issues in my own speech, um, but I hope that that has helped you show that we believe 
strongly in your self-determination. We believe strongly in what you bring to our family and how important you are to all of us here in this place. Um, I would also, I was just speaking to my honourable uh, friend who sits on the Foreign Affairs Committee with me, that perhaps uh, the Foreign Affairs Committee could invite the governors of each overseas territory to come and give evidence to us uh, over the next year so that they can speak to us directly about the issues that matter most to the overseas territories they represent. Um, but I would finish just by saying thank you to all of you for coming here. I, I'm also aware that we got you in the chamber an hour and a half before the debate started. Uh, thank you ever so much, um, and thank you, Madam Speaker, and for the commitment of this chair to our overseas family. Thank you. Can I add uh, my very warm welcome to our friends from the overseas territories? Um, the question is, as on the order paper, as many as are of that opinion say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. And I'm sorry I had to hurry people along. It's just that we do have another debate and really only an hour to get on with it.